Hello, everybody, and welcome to Jacob in Between, where we analyze the in-between crevices or crevici of fashion and the world uh, that uh, breathes within. There is a psychology behind purchasing. There is a psychology behind how brands make us buy and come back for more. And in some cases, that psychology might just be sadist to a point where you might cringe at your own self. Before we get to it, subscribe to my channel here on the tubes, push that notification button, push the join button next to the subscription button, become a member today, get access to extra perks, join me also on Patreon, Super Deco all spelled together there as well. Thank you to my members and patrons who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a virtual audience. Ta -ta 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 Here we are, you guys. Now listen, let's talk about this topic. I do not. Okay, so one of my um, followers sent me this link, and I do not. It, it was a DM. It was a private uh, thing. So I do not know if they want to be mentioned because it was a private thing. So thank you for you know who you are. Thank you for sending me the link to this article about fashion, and we're going to be talking the psychology behind a five hundred thousand dollar bag. This is from Psychology Today, uh, an article from Psychology Today. Um, by Douglas Van Pret. Douglas, thank you so much for writing this. This is amazing. By the way, you guys, listen, let's get to this uh, quickly. Um, basically, uh, what is written in psychology today is what successful marketing has in common with uh, psychopathic narcissism. Now, I, this is fascinating. And don't get scared about, you know, I, I know a lot of you are going to hear this, you're going to click away. Uh, don't stick with me because this is very interesting. So the key points that we're going to touch base on here is um, our most seemingly irrational desires usually have rational reasons explained by the psychological mechanisms underlying them. Luxury brands often win big by using the same strategy seen in people with narcissistic personality disorder and or high levels of psychopathy. I, I kind of felt this was the case, but like this kind of made me go like, contrary to popular belief, negative, unreliable relationships can exert stronger influence than positive, trustworthy ones. That kind of rings a few bells, you know, being in a relationship with a douchebag, with the abusive type, and kind of keep coming back for more because you can't get... Because you can't let go of that person. Oh, child. Yeah. The same thing is mirroring in brands. Now let's get to it. Conventional. Okay. So conventional wisdom suggests that the best way to create a strong emotional bond with someone is to build trust by being reliable, dependable, and predictable. Trust is the glue that binds relationships it should therefore come as no surprise that many businesses invest so much money and effort into customer relationship management through responsive consistency in service and branding. Yet some luxury brands seem to do the exact opposite. What does this mean? This means that, you know, technically you think, oh, you know, we always complain about it on my channel. Like, oh my God, they treated me so poorly. The customer service was so bad. Uh, yada, yada. Uh, and well, this article, uh, the thesis here is that, well, a lot of brands are uh, employing the opposite, the reverse psychology. They're going to treat you bad because they want you to come back for more. Sick, isn't it? Sick. Oh my God, Alina, you read this yesterday? We're in sync, girl. Negative relationships can create stronger bonds. Let that sink in for a second. We've all been there. Negative relationships can create stronger bonds. Psych uh, psychologists have long argued that negative interaction is actually a path to stronger bonding and that inconsistency, not reliability, amplifies emotional ties. Harvard professor B.F. Skinner, the father of behaviorism, observed this decades ago when he taught lab mice to push a lever to receive food. In contrast to the mice that received the tasty morsels consistently every time a lever was pushed, 
the mice that received random rewards at irregular intervals became addicted to lever pushing. Skinner and Furster, 1957. Let me translate this for you guys into our modern day luxury consumer world. What they're saying here is you won't get addicted to the brand. Random example, Chanel. If every time you go to the beauty boutique and you buy a little something, something, they give you great freebies. They don't do that. What they do is sometimes they'll, they'll give you hardly anything and sometimes they're going to give you a lot so that you keep guessing. You keep coming back for more. Just like that mouse that randomly gets food and sometimes it doesn't get food when it pushes the lever, it gets addicted to pushing the lever to always see what it will receive because there is no pattern there or is there? We are such freaking guinea pigs and we don't even know just how much of a freaking guinea pig we are to these brands. But I guess we're going to need another TikToker to let us know about this in the future. And until then, this information will not go viral. This phenomenon is called intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent. In intermittent. Intermittent. I'm just going to pronounce every T properly, even though, anyway, you know what I mean. So the intermittent reinforcement, and it is still known today as among the most powerful motivators on the planet. Our brains learn through the satisfying release of dopamine. When we make a prediction and it comes true, we are rewarded with the secretion of dopamine. Once it is learned, we no longer need the reward of dopamine to encourage our behavior. Dopamine neurons, neurons get even more excited by surprising rewards, such as discovering that a hard-to-find handbag you've always wanted just arrived at your local store. I've been employing this little uh, escamotage as well with the unicorn bag. It's a special treat. Happens from time to time. You see what I mean? Of course, I've been doing that because I have been uh, criticizing and I have been um, commenting on the unicorn bag concept, the FOMO that comes with the unicorn bag concept. So obviously there has been a... Um, I've been trying to instigate a conversation with that. Uh, choice of releasing the unicorn bag, the FOMO unicorn bag on my channel. This Gimimore neurotransmitter is responsible for wanting, craving, and motivating us in many ways, including the desire for sex, drugs, gambling, and even shopping. Intermittent reinforcement is also seen in people who are high in psychopathy and in personality disorders such as narcissistic personality disorder. Despite largely lacking the capacity for genuine empathic connections, individuals with these traits intuitively captivate and manipulate others while also elevating their social status. The more erratically and infrequently they offer breadcrumbs of affection, the more their victims tend to crave their love and seek their approval. This emotional roller coaster of reward and punishment is called traumatic bonding. In traumatic bonding, the victim bonds to the abuser because of poor treatment, not despite of it. This bond enables the abuser to exert control and influence others. Dutton and Painter, 1981, indicated that this only occurs in the context of a key environmental factor, an imbalance of power. If a highly narcissistic abuser lacks the upper hand, intermittent reinforcement loses its grip. Now, here's an interesting one. Adaptations, not illness, not illnesses. 
Some researchers, er, some researchers have begun to view psychopathy and narcissism not as illnesses, per se, but rather as adaptations that can confer advantages in life. As Haltzman et al., 2015, put it, we suspect that variability in narcissism has been preserved across evolutionary history because the particular costs and benefits associated with narcissistic attributes depend on a wide range of environmental factors. These researchers suggest that novel idea that narcissism has been selected for two primary advantages because it facilitates short-term mating and helps to elevate a person within a dominance hierarchy. Similarly, Pullman et al. in 2021 states, psychopathy has historically been conceptualized as a mental disorder, but there is growing evidence that it may instead be an alternative adaptive life history strategy designed by natural selection. Darwinism much? When, com uh, when comparing psychopaths to neurologically healthy individuals, these researchers report the following. Our results fail to support the mental disorder model and partly support the adaptive strategy model. The main goals of these adaptations are to attain and maintain status. While everyone can appreciate an occasional boost in prestige, people who are high in psychopathy or narcissism, or both, tend to pursue high status at all costs. As uh, Grapsus et al. Uh, 2019 concluded, narcissists are driven by a dominant status motive, meaning that it overshadows other motives, such as the motive for affiliation. In other words, their motivation to climb the social ladder eclipses their need to maintain close relationships. Back to human instincts as marketing strategies. Our brain's reaction to intermittent rewards is capitalized on by some brands. Take Hermes. Why? Don't mind if I do? Take Hermes one of the most powerful brands in the world. Currently, the iconic Parisian brand ranks 23rd worldwide, according to Interbrand. We've been talking about this on my channel in the past. Connect the dots, people. Its coveted Birkin bags command the highest prices in the world, ranging from $9,000 to a record-setting $500,000 at auction. Despite no prominent logos featured on the bag, well, I don't agree with this, but the person writing this article is not a fashionista, after all. The prominent logo is the turn lock and a little golden or silver, depending on the hardware, Hermes right underneath it. We know, if you know, you know, a logo doesn't just have to be a big fat name. A logo can also be a turn lock because that turn lock is so popular that it became a logo. Anyway, it's coveted. Okay, so anyway, despite no prominent logos featured on the bag, the Birkin has become the ultimate symbol of elevated status. Interestingly, Hermes built its brand without a marketing department. Isn't that fascinating? Is this an allegation? Because brand market Hermes doesn't have a brand marketing. I need proof of that. Instead, using its self-proclaimed anti-marketing approach that focused on personal relationships. This method flies in the face of traditional customer-centric models. Because the handmade bags are so scarce and demand so high, the sales associate, not the customer, has the dominance in this relationship. The customer must establish and nurture relationships with sales associates to earn the chance to be allowed to buy a Birkin. Customers have reportedly waited years to buy a single bag, and while the customer waits, they can buy a fancy fragrance, an upscale scarf, or a luxurious watch to earn the affection of and to strengthen the bond with the salesperson. 
Even if the customer is graced by the ability to buy the prized bag, they still are not permitted to choose the color, the type of leather, the hardware, the size, or stitching, because every bag is uniquely handmade. Well, this is not completely true. They will let you, depending what relationship you have with them, they might just let you choose. As no two bags are alike, the features available are often essentially random. But that rarely stops a customer from buying. The next uh, chapter is a warning. It says, don't try this at home. Unlike highly narcissistic individuals who usually seek to deceive, devalue, and take value from others, Hermes does provide value through social and financial benefits. The bags provide value not only in the form of rarefied status, but also as an investment over time. The Birkin bag has reportedly outpaced both the S&P 500 and the price of gold in the last 35 years, according to Time magazine. In fact, Hermès leaves money on the table every year, as resellers demand even higher prices on the black market, which is difficult to control. That hasn't stopped the brand from becoming an $18 billion company today with a total workforce of nearly 17,000 people that has nearly doubled in the past 10 years. Brands don't live on the shelves of luxury boutiques. They live... Okay, let me... Pause. You guys. Focus. Let's get mind blown. Brands don't live on the shelves of luxury boutiques. Brands live within the minds of people. Let that sink in. That is, let that sink in. That is so important. As with all psychological phenomena, there are underlying neurobiological and, and uh, psychosocial mechanisms in play. Intermittent reinforcement is just one of them. Of course, this doesn't work with just any brand. It must be combined with a power differential. If you see yourself as somehow lacking or having the lesser hand in a relationship, ask yourself this. Am I really in love with that Himalayan uh, crocodile leather handbag? Am I really in love with that diamond tennis bracelet? Or am I really in love with that ridiculously expensive watch? Maybe there is something else going on here. Not all strong bonds are formed out of love and trust. Especially when you're the only one in the relationship who feels that way. And uh, that is the mind-blowing article. Uh, what do you guys have to say? Your words. You always say you buy into the dream. Exactly. Debbie, I say you always buy into the dream because it lives within you. You, The brand lives inside of you, not on the shelves of the store. In your dreams, your projection, you are projecting whatever lack of whatever emotion, whatever instability, whatever, whatever the heck it is that some doctor might or might not be able to diagnose you as having, whatever it is or not having, it's always you. And they know, the brands know how to manipulate and make you project in a direction that they want you to project. I'm telling you, Amazing. Isn't this amazing? I mean, we knew this, you know, it just, uh, we didn't put it into such fancy and beautiful words like this wonderful gentleman did. Let's, uh, you know, give him credit again. I mentioned, okay, now, now this freaking thing doesn't want to work for me. Um, the iPad, I mean, Mr. Douglas Van Pret from Psychology Today. Um, KDF says, it's your own imagination and psychological defenses. Yes. We are owned by relationships, says Anna. Consumerism, anything and everything that can make us feel better or worse. Forming of connections and being included are more important than the outcome of the treatment. <sighs> 
Donnie says three words. Purse on fleek. Coincidentally, she said, uh, just declared that she's ready to move on and shop at Hermes again. Oh, fabulous. Good. <laughs> well, I guess we're going to get a wonderful new content coming soon. I think we know this deep down. It's It, it slips our minds at times, though, says Debbie. Yeah, I also uh, uh, agree with you. I think we do. Dixie says it's working well for Chanel. Well, they're going very much down that route of mistreating the customer and kind of like giving little to nothing and uh, demanding everything and making you kind of almost beg to be able to give them everything uh, for nothing. It's 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 so it's a wonderful game. It's almost I mean it's diabolical in its in its con concept and conception, but the di di the diabolical aspect of it is fascinating because the structure is so crystalline. It's so transparent, actually, and so perfect. It's like clockwork. It's like a diamond. It works. Um, <laughs> Gwen Lee says, yes, personally caved after she saw the Rose Sakura Constance wallet. Well, if it takes that little. Uh, the screen went black for a second. Oh, it did? We all blacked out. It was a, it was a group blackout. Alina says, I tell myself that my love of luxury is irrational, but yet I'm always chasing the high. Yeah, I mean, we definitely have that endorphin kick rushing in us. But also, I got to say, I've been trying to work this out for me and to go into that other direction and kind of really analyze my desires. Um trying to justify certain wants and needs. First of all, I always say this, you always have to really be careful and differentiate uh, what you want from what you need. Those are two different things. And we oftentimes tend to kind of merge the two and think that it's the same thing, like what you want and what you need is not the same thing. Sometimes it can be, but it's not, it's not the same thing. Uh, always. You can't generalize. Right. And, um, and, uh, you know, take Chanel, for example, you know, one of my favorite brands, uh, um, you, you, you fall for the FOMO when they release something new, some seasonal piece, and then you think, oh my God, I got to have this. But what I kind of exercise uh, and I try to teach myself is, okay, Jacob, hold on, rewind, go back. And, and and remember why you love this brand. You love this brand for its heritage. You love it for Coco. Coco is my anchor. Coco saves me from spending too much. <laughs> because then I, I think of her, I think of what she did, hers, and I think about, okay, that's what I love about the brand. But the brand often tries to make me veer in another direction because they want me to buy whatever they make now. And I save myself money by not allowing them to take me there. From time to time, I do, but mo for the most part, not allowing me to take me there. Instead, I keep anchoring myself to Coco, who is no longer with us, so she cannot produce anything new anymore. So there is a limited amount of uh, designs and styles that she conceived during her lifetime, and I stick to those. That's my anchor. And I always ask myself, does this piece that I'm seeing now at Chanel, is that anchored within her, or is this going in that other direction? And if I see that it's not anchored to her, then I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going there. That's not Chanel. That is a travesty. That is a fake. The boy bag. Coco never designed the boy bag. I will never buy the boy bag. I don't care if it looks good or bad. It's a travesty. You know what I mean? It's hiding. It's true essence is not Chanel. It's something else. So I anchor myself back to Coco and I think, okay, is this Coco? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Red alert, red alert, alarm, alarm, alarm. I don't buy it. That's how I kind of tick to preserve myself, to not become fully victim to the brand uh, of today, um, to not become, you know, the advent calendar. Oh, you see, it's a great example. The Chanel number no. five advent calendar. That Chanel number no. five bottle is the fake image. It is they play into my love of Chanel number no. five. And I, you know how much I love Chanel number no. five. I love it to bits. I just, I, I love Chanel number no. five so much. Uh, the pure perfume in particular. 
So what they give you is an oversized bottle that resembles the pure perfume bottle out of paper, right? And they make you start fantasizing about the beauty of the perfume, how much you love it, its history, its heritage. But then the interior of that bottle that promises so much because it promises history and heritage, what they deliver on the inside has nothing to do minus the perfume, actual little perfume bottle in there. But everything else has nothing to do with Chanel. Nothing to do with Chanel number no. 5, with its essence, and nothing to do with the heritage that Coco left behind. But they're tricking you to spend so much money because they give you the illusion of it being Chanel. And so I'm struggling and always fighting to always, you know, push that curtain aside and see what's behind the curtain and understand, ah, oh, okay, wait a minute. Here they're tricking me. They're putting a Chanel logo on something that is not Chanel at its core. So as much as I feel FOMO for this product that they're just releasing now, and it seems amazing, I'm not going to go there because I see that at its core, this is not Chanel. It just has a Chanel logo on it. So might as well just order something from AliExpress and put a Chanel logo on it. It's the same. I don't care if they give you the promise of, yeah, but it's good quality. The people manufacturing it were paid well. I don't have proof of any of that. Matter of fact, a lot of people are complaining about the quality being, you know, in decay more and more and more. So even that is no longer a security that I have when I, when I buy something there. That, well, it, the design might not be at its core Chanel DNA, but at least the quality is what Chanel used to. No, even that ain't there no more. You got to really look at the pieces and find one that is really well made. So this is what I do to try to balance out the desires, the FOMO, fear of missing out, um, to, to, to kind of weed out what is it that I really crave and what is it that, I, that they're making me crave. And it's tough. It's a constant struggle, especially when a brand that you love so much makes 10 to 11 collections every year. They keep pecking at you. They keep showing you new stuff 11 collections a year, that's almost one collection a month. You never have peace. You're constantly exposed to the new, to the FOMO, to new desires, wanting more, fear of missing out on the newest thing that's just been released that's already selling out. Um, and uh, you end up kind of, oh my God, oh my God, let me buy more, 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 more. And, and, but you never get to enjoy anything you have really because, I mean, you, you're just kind of like grasping for air, but you never get to really breathe. And that's what I'm really, really fighting uh, to, to stop. I don't want to be that type of consumer. I don't want to be that type of victim. I don't always succeed. I don't always manage to um, block it out and not fall victim to it. Oh, hell no, I don't. But at least I'm conscious of it. At least... It's a part of my thought process. At least I implement that thought process every time I'm confronted with a new product. It's exhausting because the brands are fighting for themselves, not for you. And, and, and you're kind of left there. You don't, the brands hire teams of experts to man, mind manipulate the consumer. But the consumer, you don't have that budget, girl. I don't have the budget to have a team of psychologists working for me to pep me up for the ring to get into the battle and be ready for it. And I, I have no backup. The consumer has nobody to help them. The consumer is literally dropped in a tank full of sharks and the sharks are the brands. So it's up to us to learn to build up our own force field. <coughs> mm, sorry, I just inhaled my own hair. Oof, cha. It's up to us to create our own protection mechanisms that work. That backbone that, that protects us from these brands that have their own armies. They have their own military. They have their own wars planned out for them. We don't. We are left to ourselves to fend for ourselves on our own. And it's 
it's usually a losing battle because it's one against a whole army. <sighs> you gotta be clever. You gotta be, you gotta learn. You gotta keep your eyes open uh, all the time. And it is exhaust. It is exhausting. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I want to create, and I am creating our community here because I want us to speak about this. I want us to raise awareness about this. I want us to be in, in touch with these core truths and <clears throat> pardon me and know that that this is going oh my gosh <clears throat> i have a little hair there and it's like so itchy now opal unicorn says wow so true marketing is trying to brainwash us they really are and for the most part they succeed over and over and over again And Donnie Barrios Mason says, this here is our army. <coughs> it's right there, that little hair. It got, it's, it's so itchy. Debbie says, yeah, I need to go back to meditating. Yeah, it's like be reconnected to our own core, to what, what it is that we really, really, really want as opposed to what they want us to think that we need. <clears throat> that's the bottom line. I'm going to end the video here because I got to get rid of that little itch there. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please comment down below. Let's start a conversation. <clears throat> <clears throat> Some brand sent a little hair in there to make me stop talking, probably. Conspiracy theory. Subscribe to my channel. Thumb up this video if you liked it. <clears throat> and until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Mwah.